takeaways on that legacy of creating generational wealth? And, and what would be some inspiration for people who are hoping to get into the same position at some point? I think it's so important, as I, as we talked about earlier, is just not letting fear, you know, turning your fear and making it fuel and doing your research. Get out. If you want to get into the housing market, get out, do your research, see what's available, crunch the numbers, and then, you know, find partners. I mean, there are so many people that don't want the headaches of the management that, that could be potential investment partners. And then, you know, the equity will grow. I always say, you know, you can either be on the sidelines or get in the game, but either way, it's going to happen. And I've seen it time and time again. I'll add some more points to that. I think that's, uh, I agree with everything you said. I would say that some of that fear that takes place, how do I get started? Uh, we found a best way to just get involved with people in our communities, even just talking to uh, our bankers to go and take them to lunch and have a conversation and say, Hey, this is what I'm interested in. Here's how I plan to do it. What are your thoughts? How can I work to grow? And, and you'd be surprised what you can learn from a, from a half hour, 45 minute lunch with someone like that. I would also say if you're already in a position and you're thinking, how do I, you know, build that generational, wealth, et cetera, looking at the third generation where I am right now, you know, when I graduated college, as we mentioned, I left town, you know, there was some probably some conversations about, okay, well, what's, what's really going to happen. And personally, I feel that I, I was blessed to be given that platform to go explore and learn on my own, but you have to be prepared to say, okay, how am I going to work this? If my family members don't want to get involved, you know, what is my, what is my, you know, long-term planning look like that goes back to the looking, you know, ahead, you have to be constantly planning. I'd love to talk a little bit, Dana, about uh, you write a blog with your sister, Tracy, yeah. and uh, I was reading the blog and there's there's a post of you with Taylor Swift's, Swift's parents when she was in concert at Seattle. And I'm thinking, um, and we need to talk about, the. it's not like you, you just fell into this. You, your uncle is Quincy Jones, one of the most iconic leaders in the music industry ever. Um, but I have to ask you, how did you get backstage with Taylor Swift's parents in Seattle? You know, it's funny because my uncle had no connection with that one. That actually comes from my husband. I'm in a long distance marriage. My husband lives in Nashville and I'm in Seattle and uh, he's friends with Taylor Swift's dad. And so my son here is a Swifty. He is the biggest Swifty. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome, Brad. <laughs> Christmas, my husband got tickets for the concert, and we had no idea that we'd be sitting with Taylor Swift's mom and dad. And then when we're sitting in our seats, someone comes over and taps us, and they're like, are you ready for your COVID test? And we're like, huh? You know, we're out here in the stadium. What are you talking about? And then they took us backstage, and I got to tell you, it was quite the experience. It was amazing. Wow. Talk about a family business. Uh, she's not doing too bad, is she? <laughs> I mean, her brother was there, mom, dad, they go to every show. I mean, it is truly a family production. And some of the kindest people you will ever meet. Yes. Oh, that's yes. fantastic. Yeah. You look at, you know, you look at, uh, you know, business smarts and the fact that she now owns all of her music once again. And this this current tour, she crossed the billion dollar mark in just tickets, and this was probably a couple of months ago. And uh, wow, it's just super neat to see some good people like that succeed. That that's pretty cool. Let's yeah. talk about Uncle Quincy, though. I have to I have to ask you, give give me some background and some some family stories. Quincy Jones, uh, did was he born in Seattle or just went to school in Seattle? No, Margaret, I'll tell you that my, my parents, uh, my mother's side of the family roots come from Chicago. And I'm just, that's the other part of my family lineage that I'm so incredibly proud of is that my grandfather was a carpenter. My grandmother was a lifelong domestic. And out of this little bitty two bedroom house, they raised eight individuals who all were incredible in every, I mean, my, my mom's baby brother is a federal judge. Uh, my aunt Margie, she is, um, she was the first African-American flight attendant hired by Alaska Airline and the first to retire. Um, uh, and, you know, all of my aunts and uncles um, are just phenomenal. And it was just instilled in them all to, you know, get busy. And my mother always shares stories of, you know, my uncle Quincy, when all the other kids were out playing, you know, he was just locked in the the community um gym where there was a piano and you know that was his focus and just 
laser focused on it. Yeah. So yeah, I've had, I've been very fortunate to have a front row seat to people that are passionate about what they do and figure out a way to make it happen. So, uh, any, any stories about Quincy just, uh, over the years, uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, the guy's a genius and, and some of the records that he's produced are, are some of the most iconic, successful, you know, records and songs in history. But uh, do you have a story or two about Quincy that you'd like to share? There's so many. First of all, he's one of the funniest people that I know. Um, we always end a conversation with Yolo Coco. That is, you only live once, so keep on keeping on. Um, he lives by the quote that uh, the only place is in the dictionary that success comes before work. And, um, you know, he's just, um, he, he, you can't walk away from him without just feeling invigorated and just renewed. I mean, he's got that special gift that makes you know when you're in his presence that you are the only person that matters. And um, yeah, I mean, we've, uh, we, well, I was, I'm on the board of Mopop and last uh, March we honored him uh, for the Founders Award. And just going down the lane, even for myself being raised with, you know, the old Smack Water Jack and, you know, the old albums, it was just such a timeline of history. It's, it's even hard for me to mentally wrap my head around everything that he's accomplished. Wow. Right. Brad, anything from one, you? One quick story uh, with Uncle Quincy is, uh, I agree, you, you, you don't really, until you're with him in his presence and other people around him, relish the impact that he's made on so many people's lives in, in various ways. And as I mentioned, uh, my grandfather passed away when I was very young. So I asked him, I said, Uncle Quincy, you know, tell, me, tell me about my grandfather. I don't, I don't remember him that well. Like, what would you say? And he said, your, your grandfather was a hustler. You know, from day one. And I don't know if it's a bit of a backhanded compliment, but, you know, that that's what got us here today is, is that hustling ability. And I think Uncle Quincy can relate to that as well. Yeah. Wow. That's that's such a such a rich, rich family history. That's some some amazing, uh, amazing people that your grandparents um, um, brought into the world and raised up. Um, Dana, I'd love some perspective from you. Um, our country really over the past five years or so really has had a reckoning with race and, uh, and our history and our history of, of racism in this country. I'd just love some thoughts from you, Dana, about where we are as a country in, in dealing with racism and where Seattle is more specifically when it comes to racism, because we've had to confront our past and it's been, it's been a rocky period over the past several years in America. But I'd love to hear from you some, some thoughts on that. Sure, Mark. I personally believe that we have a long way to go. Um, one of the reasons that I decided to write my story is, um, you know, I was reading Emily Flitter's book called White Wall, and it talks about banking while black. And in Emily's book, she shares how um, Jimmy Kennedy, who was a former NFL African-American star, he couldn't get uh, private banking privileges. And they taped a conversation with an employee at Chase Bank and said, you know, we don't bank with people that look like you. And I mean, this is present day. Wow. And, and you know, he had $14 million and um, they would not give him private banking status. And, you know, it's an issue. I, I see it every day. I see it still when I try to get loans and, um, you know, the pushback and they're not as desirable. And I mean, the statistics show that you know, 74% of white uh, households own homes compared to 46% of black home households. We've got to, to bring that divide smaller. We've got to bridge that, that deficit. And I think the only way that we're going to be able to do that is, as my son said, through education, through accessing funds and these programs that are available. Uh, they've got nationwide programs, not here in Seattle, but like Divi Homes that will help you do a lease with option to get into a house. Hmm. And equity is the only way to create the race, the, the financial um, equity. Yeah. It, it's just, that's the only way we can do it. It's still the oldest way is that owning a home is just the equity that you build from that is, is how you, how you start. And we have to work to, yeah, as I've said, bridge that gap. Uh, we live in Seattle, which has one of the, <laughs> It's a dwindling African-American population in this city. And you can trace that back to the last 60, 70 years uh, as uh, from the redlining to when folks realized that the central district of Seattle 
was a great place because it's so close to everything. And so the, they drove prices up, uh, different, you know, ethnicities uh, came in here and it, it forced a lot of uh, African-American families either out, they sold their homes, they moved further south. And uh, we, we, we were working hard to, how, how do we course correct that now? But yeah, like my mom mentioned there, again, we have to educate, we have to get involved in our communities, we have to speak up against these injustices. And vote. Yeah, and vote. Very important to get involved, both both nationally and your local politics. You know, um, finding candidates that are, are really supportive of your of your of your vision and, and position. Uh...